Good morning. And it is a good morning. You've had a good morning. You're having a good morning. If you're able to get up, crawl to the computer, or grab whatever device you use and hear me today, I'm speaking to you not as a sage, but conversationally, unscripted, in an unbuttoned mood, unplugged, acoustic, if you will. This will, therefore, be diffuse, discursive, digressive, and full of unexpected, subconscious, somewhat inexplicable connections. Which reminds me, this is an excellent time to reacquaint yourself with James Burke. Any time is an excellent time to reacquaint yourself with Edmund Burke. But this is simply how my mind works for certain values of mind and work. As you will know, as you are being bombarded with knowledge of, things are might difficult right now. Not just for you, not just for me, not just for a right smarter people, for everyone. We're going to get through this. Individually? No, not everybody. But that is the nature of life, in the midst of which we are always in death. No one has an assured span. To any of us it can be said, This night is thy soul required of thee. Whether at five or a hundred and five, we're all proceeding towards eternity at the same rate and speed, sixty minutes an hour. Deal with it. As the great Junior Walker put it, tomorrow's promise to no one. That being said, as long as I'm spared, I ain't going nowhere, so tonight is promised to you. The antidote for fear is information, as the antidote for crisis is data. We are in this crisis largely owing to a lack of data courtesy of the criminal gang of thieves, despots, liars, and tyrants in Beijing currently exercising de facto governmental power over a populace which did not vote for them and cannot vote them out. They're not only fascist scumbags, they're not even competent with it. But the antidote for fear is information, and that information is not reserved to the wisdom or the province of statisticians, virologists, and epidemiologists. History is information, and information is an antidote to fear because it allows for solutions and it gives hope. History certainly does. I'm reminded of something my wise and insightful friend, the Honorable John Zagrodsky of Connecticut, is wont to say of Lincoln, that character and principle grant resilience and foresight, which is why in the darkest hours of the war, as John points out, when official and unofficial Washington was panicking all around him. We can't afford to keep the war going for another month. The bottom is out of the tub. Lee's army will be on the White House lawn by sundown. Lincoln was looking forward to victory, reconciliation, and the repair of the country, and signing off on the land-grant colleges, the Homestead Acts, and the enabling legislation for the Transcontinental Railway. As one of his contemporaries said, it is history which teaches us to hope. That being so, do not panic. We'll get through this. The question is what we're going to do, each of us, with this time we've been given. You're probably at home for the duration. If you're especially unlucky, you're at home with small children for the duration. If you are extremely unlucky, or called to heroic virtue, you are not at home because you are engaged in heroic efforts to keep us all fed, clothed, healthy, and protected from enemies foreign and domestic, from crime, from terror, from war, or, again, engaged in war against an unrelenting viral foe. God bless you all, if so. From farmers to doctors, to those who keep the streets clean and pick up the rubbish, the garbage, the bins. I follow a number of farmers, ranchers, farm bureaus, and local butchers on social media. It's part of my upbringing. 
it is good. It is meet and right that we should at last recognize and applaud those who keep us clean, clothed, safe. It is very meet, right, and our bounden duty at all times and in all places, but especially now, to recognize and applaud doctors, nurses, hospital cleaners, and of course the forces, the services. But it is also very meet, right, and our bounden duty at this, especially of all times, to recognize not only shopkeepers and shop assistants who are stocking the shelves, not only truckers, lorry drivers, who are getting the truck, the produce to market, but always, always, those upon whom civilization is founded and without whom it would not exist, the farmer and the rancher. They are far too often attacked by the ignorant, the ill-disposed, and the evil. They are rarely celebrated as they ought to be. People who like to prophesy apocalyptic events, literary or otherwise, have this habit of imagining the worst in Curtis LeMay terms, something which, in effect, bombs us back to the Stone Age. Well, which Stone Age? If it's after the Neolithic farming revolution, we may make it through. If it's before, and we're reduced to forage and hunter-gatherers, 99% of us are going to die because we don't have farmers and ranchers. Let us praise them. Let us do so now, and let us cease forgetting to do so in the future. But we'll assume for these purposes that you're at home. What then? How do you remain sane, assuming you wear to begin with? What are you going to do to redeem the time? I am not speaking to you today as a sage, as if I ever wear one, but heart to heart, core ad core locutor. One of the first and best things you can do if it does not do violence to your conscience is to get up every morning and say, even before you wash your hands for the length of, oh, a Magnificat or a Nunc Dimittis, even before you clean your teeth, get up and say, This is the day the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Because it is, and you might as well. It's good for you to do so. One thing you can do during this period of time is to re-familiarize yourself with the book of Job. I suggest concentrating on the 13th chapter, the 15th verse. Now, I am a few years away from having had a triple bypass, a surgery is sometimes referred to mysteriously as a cabbage. If I'd had more cabbage and less chicken fried steak, I probably wouldn't have had the goddamned heart attack to begin with. Right now, in the pantry, there is a box of crackers with the legend, Wheat thins. No, it doesn't. I have eaten bread and biscuits. I have drunk beer and bourbon for 58 years, and it hasn't thinned me for sour apples. But that is. Consequently, I have self-isolated from the get-go. As a writer, whether of history or of appellate briefs, as the day demands, no one can tell and nobody has noticed. Brother Weems has described me as a man whose sole interests in life are books, baseball, battlefields, bourbon, big bands, beach music, and Bach. That's not quite accurate, as he leaves out quail, dove, and other upland game birds, fly fishing, and art and painting especially. But it is true that I have been engaged in the business of words all my life. Many of you shall not have been engaged in the business of words all your lives. You now have ample time to get engaged. I cannot, though I empathize, really enter into the state of mind of people who are written not being able to go on commercial cruises right now, which to me at the best of times would be a crucifixion. But let's assume you have a longing for the sea. Well... You could see how much worse your cruise could be. Lots of good books out there on Titanic. Or you can read O'Brien, or the criminally underrated Alexander Kent. Or, best of all, you could ship out with C.S. Forster. 
and not the Hornblower saga only, but also the ship, gold from Crete, his naval history of the War of 1812. Y'all see where I'm going with this. Most of you have had to retreat at best into a cloister, at worst to an anchorage, the hermit's cell. You have done this, as it was your duty to do this, to combat a viral enemy by minimizing your exposure to it or your exposing others to it, but you are exposed by doing so to another deadly enemy, idleness, sloth or sloth, both pronunciations may be used in English, which reminds me this is a wonderful time to listen to Flanders and Swan. The remedy for fear is information. The defense against idleness is learning, active learning. That does not mean that I am urging some didactic course of enforced learning. Like Tolkien, I am as allergic to that sort of thing as I am to allegory. On the other hand, every poem, every painting, every sculpture, every symphony, every pulp novel, every pop song conveys, intentionally or not, some moral view, some moral framework, that of its creator, whether the creator knows it or not. You ought to be alert to that. The way to spot it, to be wary of it, to weigh it, to take or reject it at valuation requires a certain set of tools which most of you have been denied by what passes for education nowadays. As Dorothy L. Sayers rightly pointed out, the trivium and the quadrivium armor people against appeals to emotion, advertising quackery, meaningless political rhetoric. This would be an excellent time to learn some logic and proceed therefrom through the rest of the trivium and the quadrivium, if you like. What I am urging is instead mindfulness. Now, when I use the term mindfulness, I do not mean some hippy-dippy, loosey-goosey, goopy, gloppy, gloop-reading, half-ass, new-age, horseshit buzzword. I mean the contrary of mindlessness. Your first duty right now, your duty to God, if you want to put it in those terms, is to take sufficient care of yourself that you can do your duty by your family and your neighbors, that you can serve God by serving your family and your neighbors, the first of those little platoons, as Edmund Burke put it, in society, which together make up civilization. Your second duty right now is to use, to redeem, this time you've been unexpectedly given without other calls on it. To train and fit yourself for the rebuilding, the repair, the reconstruction, and the reordering, the better ordering of things once we've got through this. And we shall get through this. It's what we do, commonly by the skin of our teeth. We as humans, have survived everything from Toba to Tambora, Krakatoa, Katla, years without summers, the 5th century BC plague of Athens, the plague of Justinian, the Black Death, the Tudor sweating sickness, cholera, further outbreaks of plague, the most notable of which was burnt out only by the Great Fire of London, and the Spanish influenza pandemic of a century ago. We have survived the consequences of our own follies, recessions, depressions, unpreparedness and appeasement allowing aggressive totalitarians to rise and launch aggressive war, with all the costs of defending against that, defeating the bastards and leaving them stretched in the dust. We even survived the 70s. I lived through that. Folks, if we could survive the winding down of Vietnam, Watergate, Disco, Leisure Suits, Unnatural Fibers, Jimmy Carter, and James Callahan, we can survive damn near anything. And not merely survive it. No one doubts the intelligence of the cetaceans. No one can fail to feel a certain kinship with the other great apes, our very distant cousins. I like dogs and horses rather better than I like most people. But only our species emerges from the rubble singing and painting 
and making poetry. No other species, though they have survived as well as we, has produced a Bach, a Handel, a Homer, a Virgil, a Dante, a Shakespeare, a Giotto, a Jan Vermeer van Delft, a Phidias, a Bernini, a Donatello whose St. George looks so like the young Joe DiMaggio. We'll get through this. The question is, when we shall have done, where shall you stand? In the ranks of those who have studied to show themselves approved, trained to run their race to fight wild beasts at Ephesus? Or are you going to crawl out with an extra 15 pounds around your middle, your free for the duration premium porn subscription, and your dick in your hand? Let's shoot for the former, shall we? Now, you're going to indulge, and no one is going to condemn you for indulging, some relaxation, some escapism. That's fine. Everyone needs a break now and then. And as Lynn Ashby once said, even Jesus went to wedding parties, but at least the one in Cana. You may take refuge and relaxation in reading fiction or listening to music. I urge you to do it mindfully, because if you think you're doing it mindlessly, you're not. The reason I'm allergic to overt allegory, to didactic fiction or art, is that I decline to have my opinions given to me by pulp novels or pop stars or poets or painters or the village idiot which leaves out most politicians or the credentialed village idiot which rules out the sort of academic who spends all their time pontificating and punditing in the press and none of it in the library, the archives, the lab, or the field. But that is precisely what happens to you if you consume music or fiction or any form of artistic expression mindlessly rather than mindfully, you absorb the opinions of others, many of whom, though they have a right to their opinion, as everyone does, have no discernible right to have their opinions taken seriously. If you're going to do that, I can only hope for your sake that you grow wool upon your person and taste like mutton when slaughtered, for you have chosen to be a sheep. Let's start with that common refuge, music. As I noted, Jerv has described me as a man whose sole interests in life are books, baseball, battlefields, bourbon, big bands, Carolina beach music, and Bach, which is inaccurate because it leaves eight Bob Wills, blues, bluegrass, and the Book of Common Prayer. But before all this began, he chivied and badgered me into checking out on YouTube some of what are called reaction videos. If, like me, you were hitherto blissfully unaware of this phenomenon, I shall explain. A reaction video is simply a post of someone's discovering music or art or literature, previously unfamiliar to her, choosing to swing at a pitch well outside his wheelhouse. Yes, like Herodotus, I'm engaged in what seems, seems, to be a digression, meandering from the main point. Wait and see. Be patient. Now, I agree with Jer, for what it's worth, and speaking of things outside one's own wheelhouse, that the five young men who formerly made up one direction are talented youths, who have been villainously ill-served by their management's past and present and their material. They and the industry into the toils, the clutches of which they fell at an early age, we at Bapton consider a standing example of how not to manage any creative artist and therefore a monitor of warning to publishers not to make similar mistakes. These five lads have been as thoroughly screwed over as anyone since the Arrows. I'm told there's a contemporary group called the Arrows. I'm referring, of course, instead to Merrill, Hooker, and Varley. That is the band which wrote, performed, and made a hit of the anthemic I Love Rock and Roll, which most of you shall associate with the cover by Joan Jett. They were given a weekly television program on, I believe, Granada, they were poised on the threshold of superstardom. And while they were on television every week with a popular program, they were unable to release any music 
because of a three-way pissing match between producer, management, and label, all of whom owed their best efforts to the band and not to themselves, to positively fiduciary levels. My own opinion of what Ike might have called the music entertainment PR complex is that it is practically indistinguishable ethically from the porn, pimping, and prostitution industry, with the exception that the latter probably has something more nearly resembling a code of ethics. The former are, after all, the people who brought us everything from Paola to Jimmy Savile. Brother Weems, however, with, I am perfectly certain, that proconsular smirk of empire, he's a good man, better and humbler than I fear I am making him sound, a good business partner, an excellent co-writer, a joy to read and a joy to edit, but he can be incredibly annoying, almost as much as am I. Brother Weems, then, however, has a certain bloodless, aloof interest in the social anthropology of seeing how and how much Americans and other such small deer of overseas fans can make a complete pig's breakfast of any British canon cultural phenomenon when they start creating a fandom. In this case, how we lesser breeds without the law react to one direction and its spiritual successor, the Australian group Five Seconds of Summer, without knowing and recognizing that every fanish trope cheeky lads, deplorable management, rabid fans, rabid shippers, without realizing that this template was established for this generation by McFly. Jerv is notably partial to British groups, McFly, the Kinks, which never really broke into the North American market. I suspect he considers them purer and more unsoiled. And this from a man who's much less anti-American than most Britons are, although he, like one of his protagonists in the Village Tales series, commonly approves those Americans the Guardian detests, and vice versa. But to return to our musical muttons. He badgered and chivied me into viewing some reaction videos by a young fellow named Nicholas Light, who, sometimes with his girlfriend, reacts to music he has not previously heard. He is a self-described rapper, he is, by the sound of him, from New York or New England. And like many other rappers and rap fans and hip-hop fans and hip-hop artists, including African-American ones, he has become enamored of, enraptured by, of One Direction and the solo careers of its former members. Pressed for my views, in response I told Jerv simply that it was surreal to see the missing Guriel brother fanboying over a boy band, and that I worried for the young man's health, and especially for his hydration, if ever he encountered the Polish Baroque countertenor, male model, and champion breakdancer, Jakub Józef Orlinski. But, and here is where Jerv and I agree, only a fool should mock the impulse of and the work done by Mr. Light, and by all such reactors. For what they are doing is a great thing. We live in a world in which our common culture has become balkanized and fragmented. Mr. Light and his fellow reactors, whether they are reacting to art, to music, to poetry, or to literature, are doing something worthy and extraordinary. They are emerging from their bunkers, from behind the parapets of preference and prejudice, and coming blinking in the sunlight sometimes naively, sometimes without much tutoring, on to the common ground strewn with ruins where once was our common culture. This is a good thing, a thing good in itself, a thing bonum in se. We ought all of us to be doing it. Yes, there's no disputing tastes. Yes, it would be an incredibly boring world if we all liked the same thing. But if ever there were a time to put aside our various prickly, musical, literary, and artistic snobberies, this is it. It is a good thing, 
when rap fans discover Rush and Rimsky Korsakov. It is cause for celebration when boy band fans discover the blues and Basie and Bach and Shirley Bassey and Bob Wills and Bluegrass and B.B. King. There is joy in heaven when headbangers and hip-hop fans discover Handel and Hawk, Coleman Hawkins, Harry James and Johann Nepomuk Hummel. When ska fans discover Skinner and Scarlatti and Satchmo. When metalheads discover Mozart and Maynard Ferguson. When EDM fans discover Elgar and Ellington and Ella. When techno types discover Tull and Telemann. When country fans and kickers and classical musicians alike discover Cab Calloway as well as Corelli and the Carter family and Johnny Cash, not to mention Willie and Waylon. And this is as true of music creators as of music consumers. I was privileged, my terminal violin tutor and my theory and composition tutor were both of them protégés of Sir John's. I remind you that Sir John Barbaroli was for a time music director and principal conductor of the Houston Symphony Orchestra. Nowadays, and particularly in this time, which we now suddenly all have on our hands, anyone may learn for free, may audit, may for an often nugatory fee get credits for learning the basic alphabet, the merest fundamentals of music from reputable academic sources. Many may learn at least how to read music, may learn scales, keys, modes, harmony, composition, and not alone through academic sources, the click of a mouse allows you to learn these things from reputable sources not affiliated with a university or a conservatory. Rick Beato comes to mind. And once you have that most basic of groundings, you can, you may, for free, avail yourself of the same musical education which Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven had. For the Scrolling Bach Project is engaged in posting scrolling high-lit scores, often including Bach's manuscript, autograph, scores, of the entire Bach catalog synchronized to performances of each piece. You can now, so long as you have the most basic grounding in music and can read a musical score, see how Almighty God, through his vessel and instrument J.S. Bach, writes music. And something similar is being done for the corpus of Anglican service music. Dark, Sumption, Bird, Tallis, Parry, Howell, Stanford, RVW, Stainer, and indeed Purcell and Handel by the YouTube channel Morph Thing One. And again, this is as true of music creators as of music consumers. Let me take, for example, two of the former members of One Direction who I am told both box and both lean towards the modern iteration of R&B. In this uncovenanted grace period, they now have what the industry never gave them, the opportunity to learn to walk before they're forced to run. They can take this time and come back counterpunching against critics and disparaging fans. Mr. Malik, for example, can delve into the blues. Sippy Wallace, Big Mama Thornton, Muddy Waters, Lead Belly. At this point, after his experiences in the industry, I imagine he could go to the crossroads in the Delta at midnight and get his soul back. He can study T-Bone Walker, John Lee Hooker, B.B. King, Etta James, Dr. John, and as R&B evolved due to its current iteration, he can do a graduate course in, say, Gregory Abbott. Mr. Payne can take the time to recognize that his falsetto is a tool only, that God meant him for a baritone, and that his native Wolverhampton on Temple Street was once the site of the catacombs, one of the cathedrals of northern Seoul. He can spend this enforced idleness with Jerry Butler, Jackie Wilson, Marvin Gaye, and being a Wolfronian, I expect he can ring up a helpful neighbor for advice on dealing with the music industry. I am sure Naughty Holder has some thoughts. 
boxes ought to take this time to train to counterpunch. My point is that even in relaxation do nothing mindlessly. Those old men in the pavilion in their eggs and bacon ties and their eggs and bacon blazes do not love cricket because they know the laws and spirit of cricket. They know the laws and spirit of cricket because they love the game and it enhances their enjoyment of the play on the field to know what is going on. Baseball fans, Saberheads, do not recite the infield fly rule or reel off statistics as a substitute for or justification of their love of the game. They know these things. They can spot a pitcher's bulk before the umpire does, particularly if that umpire is Angel Hernandez or Ron Culpa. They can spot that rarer creature, the catcher's bulk, because they love baseball and their enjoyment of the game is enhanced by their knowledge. Meanwhile, what the hell are you doing, sitting and reclining, bitching and moaning about the dearth of sports on television? You could be, you ought to be learning. But, you will say, learning is boring. You're tired of music. You're going out of your mind, staring at the same four walls and the by now uninteresting and all too familiar faces of your family or your housemates at least the two-legged ones, no one in his senses can get bored with dogs in the house. You want scenery. You wish you were on your holidays, on vacances, off on vacation. All right. When you last went on your holidays, did you take snaps? Do you have a good visual memory? This would be an excellent time to learn to paint. And Michael James Smith is your huckleberry. You wish you were on a river somewhere. If you're an angler, that's understandable. If you're a dry fly fisherman, it's understandable, and it isn't, because you're used to spending winters this way, reading the extensive literature on angling, and tying your own flies. You're not going to forget how to read a river during this quarantine. If you're afraid of that, go read some Haig Brown. Or read more generally about rivers. Peter Aykroyd on the Thames, Paul Horgan on the Rio Grande, John Graves on the Upper and Middle Brasses, Twain on the Mississippi, John M. Barry on the 1927 Mississippi Flood, Rising Tide, and you can listen to Randy Newman's Louisiana 1927 while you read it. In fact, the Ohio-Mississippi system flooded again ten years later in 1937. My late mother was living in western Kentucky at the time as a small child, that being where my grandfather's then parish was. The 1937 flood begins Brother Weems and my history of that year of portent 1937. It occurs to me that there's nothing really comparable to Horgan and Graves on the James or the Shenandoah. I'm too old, I'm booked for probably the rest of my life. Somebody needs to get on to that right shot. Read Claudio Magris on the Danube. Or perhaps you'd rather be by the seaside. The late science writer and yachtsman Nigel Calder wrote a brilliant volume on the English Channel. The great Garrett Mattingly wrote the Spanish Armada. You can get your fix of salt air. You can understand terrain. You can read John McPhee. I would read McPhee if he were writing about compost. There are very few authors of whom I can say as much. Mark Kolansky and David McCullough come to mind. You can get a sense of landscape. You may be self-isolating, but you can probably take a walk around the neighborhood, keeping a reasonable social distance from the very few others who have the gumption to get off the couch and take one. Learn to read a landscape the way W.G. Hoskins or Dr. Westheisen would read. Right now, you can audit online from reputable academic sources, often for a nugatory fee or for nothing, basic courses, including those in archaeology. Why not give it a whirl? Understand the part of the world in which you live and move and have your being. History is a succession of improbabilities, paths untaken, and narrow escapes. That's why and how we've survived. And why and how we're going to survive this. 
Read about the westward expansion of the United States. Read the great trilogy of Texas writers about that hyper-concentrated America which is contained in Texas. Read Fehrenbach, read Barnard DeVoto, but read and not mindlessly. When I mention a book in the course of this, it does not mean that I am putting the witness in the box and vouching for his credibility. History is a literary art. I'm not going to recommend anyone, historian or biographer, who, knowing what she knew at the time, please read David Hackett Fisher on the historian's fallacy. I'm not going to recommend anyone, historian or biographer, who, knowing what he knew at the time, is dishonest. That does not mean she may not be biased or that she is not trammeled in the knowledge and assumptions of her time. And it naturally does not and cannot mean that the facts she had or thought she had before her and the conclusions she drew have not perhaps been overturned, amplified, or revised by subsequent discoveries. It does mean that anyone I recommend is a good writer, thought-provoking, capable of sparking in you a new interest. When that has happened, you may then go and delve further into the field. Read the opponents, read the revisionists, read the correctives, but the first thing to do is catch your imagination and your interest. But you say all of this seems like a lot of work and a lot of faffing about, and you're tired of people telling you, but this is the moral equivalent of war without giving you anything to do. Read the McCausland stories of George MacDonald Fraser. Read Vonnegut. Read David Abrams, beginning with Foppet. Read military history as well as military fiction. Read Patton's memoirs and Grant's. Read Catton, read Southall Freeman, read Sir John Keegan, read Anthony Beaver. Read what you like of the subject, and you will soon realize what every old soldier knows, that even on the day of battle and at the moment of crisis, the greater portion of the orders of the day boil down to hurry up and wait. That's what you're called to do, and you may as well not do it mindlessly. You may as well redeem the time. Indeed, it's your duty to do so. But, you object, painting, music, reading books, shudder. Why can't I do something manly? Well, the first truly manly thing you can do, son, is to lose that damned attitude. The question is whether you're going to take this time, redeem this time, to fit yourself to play an adequate role in what comes after the rebuild. Get knowledge get the knowledge, and I'm not talking about London cabbies. Lewis Dartnell's The Knowledge may not be necessary yet, but it's like having your snake leggings when you go out shooting in South Texas. Better to have it and not need it than to need it and not have it. If nothing else, it ought to be read, marked, and inwardly digested by everyone who writes hard SF or apocalyptic fiction and kept at the elbow by anyone who reads those genres as a checklist to see how well or poorly the writer is doing. Your current duty is to take sufficient care of yourself to care for your family and neighbors. So the first really manly thing you can do is learn to cook. Put on a nice frilly apron and stop worrying and overcompensate. No man, woman, or child old enough and responsible enough to be trusted in the kitchen has any excuse whatever for not being able at least to bake a loaf of bread. And a fool who can open an oven door or bottle in a container can make beer bread. But that's not the half of your duty. Learn to bake. Perhaps it is because I am a carol on both sides of the family and my mother's mother, who died when Mumsy was quite small and whom I never knew, was born a daughter of the American line of Clarence Verde, the wards of Ballymacward and Abinachmoy, but I'd suggest that you could do a right smart worse than to learn to bake online from the Irish-born professional baker Gemma Staff. But don't stop there. You ought to be able to turn out a meal for your family from soup to nuts, and there are so many resources which will allow you to do it. There's this French guy cooking, the immortal Alex. There is, with equal wit and charm, Chef John. There's English country life. 
There are more resources than you can shake a stick at. For the love of God, use them. But you want to do something strenuous and possibly macho, so far as you understand the concept. All right. Under present conditions, it is not possible to go and sit as at the feet of Gamalgam for instruction in the wilds of Wiltshire by the legendary archaeological ironsmith Hector Cole, MBE. Those of you who have seen Michael Wood's Beowulf documentary will remember him, the ageless smith who pattern-welded an Anglo-Saxon period sword on camera. I say Anglo-Saxon period as a dating convention, even as I am increasingly unconvinced by the Anglo-Saxon myth, as shall you be if you read The Emergence of the English, which I recommend you do. But if you cannot learn from Hector Cole right now, the click of a mouse will certainly introduce you to the smithing and forging partnership of Alex Steele and Will Stelter. Believing, as I do, with Chesterton and John Lucas, that coincidences are, often as not, spiritual puns, I pause in amusement to reflect that I have just recommended, as Smiths, Cole, Steele, and Stelter. The last of these may be a trifle inobvious until one realizes that Stelter is a German and sometimes Dutch surname, meaning the lame one. You know, like Hephaestus, Vulcan, and Wayland Smith. Alex Steele is originally from East Anglia, indeed from Norfolk, indeed from near Norwich. Will Stelter is an American. They now have a forge and smithy in the Intermountain West. They are young, enthusiastic, charismatic, energetic, and indeed sometimes slightly over-caffeinated smiths. And more than mere smiths, they can make you a Viking battle axe, a Carolingian era sword, or a Roman legionary gladius, woodwork its handle, give it a scabbard of decorated or worked leather, and set jewels on the pummel. They are standing rebuke, both of them, to everything I and other old farts tend to say about young people these days. You kids, get off my lawn! They would doubtless tell you that they are smiths and entrepreneurs only. And they are that. They are also brilliant instructors determined to learn something new every day, including from their mistakes which they do not hide but broadcast, and how to recover from them. Mr. Steele reminds me of no one so much as a young, grammar school-educated Fred Dibner. But whatever they think, and however much they would deprecate this, what they are in fact engaged in is experimental industrial archaeology. Indeed, it was on that basis that, before Mr. Steele left East Anglia for America, I corresponded on the subject with Dr. Sam Newton, the Sutton Who man. May God bless him and all his little luffings. Do not be idle in this time. Do not give way to sloth. Learn something new every day, and even in your relaxations, do not relax mindlessly. After you have done your daily duty to your family and your neighbors, and you wish to relax and recharge, you may be in the mood for a little escapism. That's fine, but be careful where you escape to. Again, everything you read, every musical note you hear, Every stroke of every paint is charged with the opinions and outlook of its creator, and you ought to preserve an independent judgment. If you do not have the foundations, you can be bowled over and swept away by any fascination without knowing its basis and validity. Peter Ackroyd is a seductively brilliant writer of what he calls and others call psychogeography, I trust him on myth. I trust him on the origins of imagination, and particularly English imagination. I don't always quite trust him on fact and history. This is an instance of the Gell-Mann effect. Look it up. In the same way, I'm always, on every reading, both stunned and enlightened by Roberto Colasso. I would not, all the same, recommend the marriage of Cadmus and Harmony, to anyone not already familiar with the Greek myths and with ancient history, it is too easy to be swept away. Read instead Jenkins' The Victorians in Ancient Greece, 
or Davidson's Courtesans and Fish Cakes. Read Everett and Tom Holland on the Romans. But it is not history only which gives us hope. Perhaps for your relaxation you wish to retire for a time to that world in which justice always triumphs with whatever casualties and whatever scars and whatever costs on the way. Those of us who are my age are fortunate that we have seen on the small screen the definitive Holmes, the definitive Miss Marple, the definitive Poirot, incarnated in Jeremy Brett, Joan Hickson, and David Suchet, whose memoir of his time portraying Poirot, entitled Poirot and Me, is irresistibly well worth reading. It can be argued that we have also seen the definitive Lord Peter Whimsey in Ian Carmichael's portrayal, not that of Petherbridge, and the definitive Albert Campion, as played by Tristan Farnett, I mean the fifth doctor, I mean Peter Davison. But Sir Arthur did not depend upon television to create Sherlockians or to gain followers for the sacred canon. Dame Agatha did not rely upon television for her stupendous sales or for the affection in which the world holds that formidable spinster and that insufferable little Belgian. Miss Sayers and Miss Allenham likewise did not require television to create lifelong fans of Lord Peter and of Mr. Campion, as perhaps John Mortimer of Rumpole fame did. In the same way, fans, often wary and reluctant fans, of G.K.C. and his father Brown, with all the faults of that creator, and they are many and nearly unforgivable, are neither made nor marred by the buffoonery of the recent despicable television version. But perhaps because of a lack of similar exposure, Post's remarkable Uncle Abner stories, set in a Western Virginia not yet become a West Virginia before the war, and to those who suggest I bear a certain resemblance to that stout, fussy, pompous, legally-minded and thus narrow-minded magistrate Squire Randolph, I can only plead no low contendery. Marsh's Inspector Allen, Freeman's splendid barrister pathologist Dr. Thorndike, all of the work of Michael Gilbert and of Michael Ennis, and of Crispin's Professor Fenn, have all been overlooked, as has Judge D, the great folk hero magistrate of Imperial China, as chronicled by R. H. Van Gulik, a figure based upon the Imperial scholar statesman D. Jinjie. They're well worth your time. Like all detective fiction, all mystery stories which are worth your time, they have something to say about justice and that it prevails. That is a good lesson to keep in mind just now. Even if you must have it to make yourself happy in more modern clothes and with a spice of subversion to it, in which case allow me to introduce you to the other Miss Reed in my life, Cousin Cornelia. The other Miss Reed in my life. Perhaps for your relaxation you wish to escape to the countryside. Do you understand the countryside, the working countryside, if not, it might not hurt to familiarize yourself with it from its deepest origins and the traces they have left to its current state. And let us once more praise not famous men and our fathers in their generations, but the farmer and the rancher. Read some Sally Irwin. Read some John Graves. Read some A.C. Green. For one thing, in addition to all else, if you read Graves, himself an Anglican, and his contrast between Anglicanism and the frontier spirit, and the chapter in Green's A Personal Country, entitled God in West Texas, you'll understand more about our present Kulturkampf than you could get from a thousand sociology textbooks. But you want to escape to the countryside. You are living, and you now know you're living, due to this isolation, a life of quiet desperation in city or suburb. Allow my friend Curtis Edmonds to point out subtly that grace touches and operates there as well. But you want to escape to the country, to bucolics and Georgics. That's understandable. We as a species have been doing that for millennia, 
as everyone from Hazard, J.H. Plum, and Wallace Notenstein can attest, that's fine. Don't do it mindlessly. Escape to Miss Reed's Caxley and Fairacre and Thrush Green. Escape to the villages of Barbara Pym's work. Escape, rejoicing, to Peter Mon's Batch Magna. Escape to the Wolfens and their extensive rural districts, the Downlands and the Vale, in Brother Weems' village tales. Escape to Trollops, Barchester, and Barsetshire. But be mindful how you go. For these, like all fictional locations, are perilous realms, however familiar seeming they are, Far from the fields we know, this would be an excellent time to read or reread The King of Elfland's Daughter. So escape, if you like, to the little kingdom centered upon Ham, to Wooden Major, to the Shire, to Numenor, to Narnia. But know that these are perilous realms. Take this unexpected opportunity, this gift of time, to read the Silmarillion in one sitting, if you like and afterwards to gorge upon Dr. Femi's scholarship. But mind how you go. You cannot be too careful. Anything may happen, as in life, and with similar lessons. We are in a darkling wood. We always are. We do not know what may come to us. I wrote many years ago in an essay reprinted in I think the Bapton Books sampler, or perhaps in the Transatlantic Disputations, that it is the hand that turns the page, not the hand that rocks the cradle, which holds the scepter of the world. So much of what was once the common culture of adulthood, from Aesop onwards, including of all people Swift and Stevenson, has been relegated to the nursery. But as I pointed out, by the time a young person is in his or her teens, Certainly by the time he or she is ready for sixth form or university, he or she ought to be prepared to encounter the Nicomachean ethics and shall be prepared to encounter it if he or she spent time when young with Reaper Cheap the Mouse, Truffle Hunter, Mr. Badger, Mr. Bilbo Baggins, and Alan Breck Stewart, a baptism of the imagination. Like it or not, we do get our ethics, or acquire an inoculation against ethics, from our purportedly mindless reaping for pleasure. For example, we get our land ethic, or don't, from Aldo Leopold, John Muir, Walton and Cotton, or from tracking the spoor of orcs through Rohan. Mind how you go. You may think that it's safe to give yourself as a respite from the horrors of the news of the present, that not unpleasant chill up the spine one gets from a good old-fashioned ghost story. Mind how you go. M. R. James, Susan Hill, Manley Wade Wellman, John Buchan, George Knight, all have something to say of ethics, morals, justice, retribution, balance, consequences of ethics. I note that Susan Hill was born on the Yorkshire coast, and that quite half of George Knight's ghost stories are set in that East Anglia which M. R. James so haunts. Wellman, in turn, sets his tales, which straddle the line between those two rather different genres, horror and the ghost story, in Appalachia. Most such stories in American literature are set in the American South, or somewhat less often in New England, the two areas of the country which Flynn O'Connor could call, even in a post-Christian world, Christ-haunted. English ghost stories tend, it seems, to cluster mostly on a line from the East Riding to East Anglia. Peter Ackroyd has suggested that the English ghost story, not so much the supernatural tales of the Welsh, the Scots, the Irish, and the Cornish, derives most of its power from a guilty nostalgia for the Roman Catholic past. Certainly both Yorkshire and East Anglia were, before the Reformation, notable centers of Roman Catholic piety. It is no accident that both Dame Julian and Marjorie Kemp were East Anglians. And I note that East Anglia, at least, swiftly became just as violently a seedbed of the most Cromwellian, round-headed Protestantism. 
I'm inclined to wonder if there is an explanation or an association here. And I'm inclined to think that Dr. Francis Young might be able to tell me. That Dr. Susan Westheisen might be able to point at it in the landscape. And that Dr. Francis Pryor might be able to trace it back to the Mesolithic. This is an example of reading mindfully, thinking about what you've read, however casually, and wandering about it, which we ought all of us to be doing. Mind how you go. We are all in a darkling wood. Light thickens. And if you cannot escape right now to woodland, you can read Oliver Rackham and Roger Deakin and Simon Shama, Landscape and Memory, and immerse yourself from your armchair in the wild wood, the free green wood, or iron wood, or murk wood, or the wood at the world's end, or the wood of Nehemiah, and feel the ancient reverence, the ancient influence, which has always haunted us from Homer to John Muir, the realm of Blake's The I Am of the Oaks of Albion. Your most casual reading can and ought to spark your mind and wake your soul. In fact, it's going to do that whether you wish it to or not. So mind how you go. After all, right now, in this journal of a plague year, to borrow from Defoe, another writer for grown-ups exiled to the kitty shelf, you have all too much time and you shall be tempted to idleness and to despair. There is no warrant for despair. Read Philip Ziegler on the Black Death. Read Ben Gummer's The Scourging Angel. Read Kelly and Cantle. We are going to make it through this. And that imposes a duty on you and on all of us to mind how we go. To husband and redeem our unexpected grant of time. To fit ourselves for the tasks ahead once we've made it through this. And whether you mean it to or not, what you read, what you listen to, even in your idle hours, if you have any, is going to shape your fitness for participating in that task. One thing I beg you to do is to keep a journal of this play year, to save your correspondence and your emails. The cure for fear is information, the antidote to crisis is data, and history has nothing to do with great vast impersonal objective forces. It is mass biography, and no matter how unimportant you are believed to be by everyone but yourself and God, you have at this moment the opportunity to furnish primary sources for future historians to help avert recurrences of this disaster or to handle them should they arise. We are going to make it through this, and that imposes a duty on all of us to mind how we go, to redeem the time. I'm not dictating to you how to do that. I am begging you to do it. And I'm offering some suggestions which you may take or leave. But I hope that at the very least you are willing, you are eager, to make one of those who, when we shall have made it through this, is prepared to, fit to, ready to, willing to, eager to aid in the reconstruction, the repair, and the better ordering of the society which emerges. Mind how you go, and God and good fortune go with you. I'll see you next Sunday. Stay calm, stay strong, fear not, and wash your hands.